The Things They Carried, Chapter 9, Part 2. A good sharp mind, Rat said. True, she could be silly sometimes, but she picked up on things fast. At the end of the second week, when four casualties came in, Marianne wasn't afraid to get her hands bloody. At times, in fact, she seemed fascinated by it. Not the gore so much, but the adrenaline buzz that went with the job, that quick, hot rush in your veins when the chopper settled down and you had to do things fast and right. No time for sorting through operations, no thinking at all. You just stuck your hands in and started plugging up holes. She was quiet and steady. She didn't back off from the ugly cases. Over the next day or two, as more casualties trickled in, she learned how to clip an artery and pump up a plastic splint and shoot in morphine. In times of action, her face took on a sudden new composure, almost serene, the fuzzy blue eyes narrowing into a tight, intelligent focus. Mark Fossey would grin at this. He was proud, yes, but also amazed. A different person, it seemed, and he wasn't sure what to make of it. Other things, too. The way she quickly fell into the habits of the bush. No cosmetics, no fingernail filing. She stopped wearing jewelry, cut her hair short, and wrapped it in a dark green bandana. Hygiene became a matter of small consequence. In her second week, Eddie Diamond taught her how to disassemble an M16, how the various parts worked, and from there it was a natural progression to learning how to use the weapon. For hours at a time, she plunked away at sea ration cans, a bit unsure of herself. But as it turned out, she had a real knack for it. There was a new confidence in her voice, a new authority in the way she carried herself. In many ways, she remained naive and immature, still a kid. But Cleveland Heights now seemed very far away. Once or twice, gently, Mark Fossey suggested that it might be time to think about heading home. But Marianne laughed and told him to forget it. Everything I want, she said, is right here. She stroked his arm and kissed him. On one level, things remained the same between them. They slept together. They held hands and made plans for after the war. But now, there was a new imprecision in the way that Marianne expressed her thoughts on certain subjects. Not necessarily three kids, she'd say. Not necessarily a house on Lake Erie. Naturally, we'll still get married, she'd tell him, but it doesn't have to be right away. Maybe travel first. Maybe live together. Just test it out, you know. Mark Fossey would nod at this, even smile and agree, but it made him uncomfortable. He couldn't pin it down. Her body seemed foreign somehow, too stiff in places, too firm where the softness used to be. The bubbliness was gone. The nervous giggling, too. When she laughed now, which was rare, it was only when something struck her as truly funny. Her voice seemed to reorganize itself at a lower pitch. In the evenings, when the men played cards, she would sometimes fall into long, elastic silences, her eyes fixed on the dark, her arms folded, her foot tapping out a coded message against the floor. When Fossey asked about it one evening, Marianne looked at him for a long moment, then shrugged. It's nothing. Really nothing. To tell the truth, I've never been happier in my whole life. Never. Twice, though, she came in late at night. Very late. And then finally, she did not come in at all. Rat Kylie heard about it from Fossey himself. Before dawn one morning, the kid shook him awake. He was in bad shape. His voice seemed hollow and stuffed up nasal sounding, as if he had a bad cold. He held a flashlight in his hand, clicking it on and off. Mary Ann, he whispered. I can't find her. Rat sat up and rubbed his face. Even in the dim light, it was clear that the boy was in trouble. There were dark smudges under his eyes, the frayed edges of somebody who hadn't slept in a while. Gone, Fossey said. Rat. Listen, she's sleeping with somebody. Last night, she, di she didn't even... I don't know what to do. A 
abruptly then, Fossey seemed to collapse. He squatted down, rocking on his heels, still clutching the flashlight. Just a boy, 18 years old, tall and blonde, a gifted athlete. A nice kid too, polite and good-hearted, although for the moment none of it seemed to be serving him well. He kept clicking the flashlight on and off. All right, start from the start, Rat said, nice and slow, sleeping with who? I don't know who, Eddie Diamond. Eddie? Has to be. The guy's always there, always hanging on her. Rat shook his head. Man, I don't know. Can't say it strikes a right note, not with Eddie. Yes, but he's easy does it, Rat said. He reached out and tapped the boy's shoulder. Why not just chuck some bunks? We've got nine guys. You and me, that's two, so there's seven possibles. Do a quick body count. Fossey hesitated. But, but I can't. If she's there, I mean, if she's with somebody. Oh, Christ. Rat pushed himself up. He took the flashlight, muttered something, and moved down to the far end of the hooch. For privacy, the men had rigged up curtain walls around their cots, a small makeshift bedroom. And in the dark, Rat went quickly from room to room, using the flashlight to pluck out the faces. Eddie Diamond slept a hard, deep sleep. The others, too. To be sure, though, Rat checked once more very carefully, then he reported back to Fossey. All accounted for. No extras. Eddie? Darwin dreams. Rat switched off the flashlight and tried to think it out. Maybe she just... I don't know, maybe she's camping out tonight. Under the stars or something. You searched the compound? Sure did. Well, come on, Rat said. One more time. Outside, a soft violet light was spreading out across the eastern hillsides. Two or three Arvin soldiers had built their breakfast fires, but the place was mostly quiet and unmoving. They tried the helipad first, then the mess hall and supply hooches, then they walked the entire 600 meters of perimeter. Okay, Rat finally said. We've got a problem. When he first told the story, Rat stopped there and looked at Mitchell Sanders for a time. So what's your vote? Where was she? The Greenies, Sanders said. Yeah? Sanders gave him a savvy little smirk. No other option. That stuff about the special forces, how they used the place as a base of operations, how they'd glide in and out, all that there had to be there for a reason. That's how stories work, man. Rat thought about it, then shrugged. All right, sure. The Greenies. But it's not what Fossey thought. She wasn't sleeping with any of them. At least, not exactly. I mean, in a way, she was sleeping with all of them, more or less, except it wasn't sex or anything. They were just lying together, so to speak. Marianne and these six grungy, weirded-out green berets. Lying down? Sanders said. You got it. Lying down how? Rat smiled. Ambush. All night long, man. Mary Ann's out on a fucking ambush. Just after sunrise, Rat said, she came trooping in through the wire, tired looking but cheerful, as she dropped her gear and gave Mark Fossey a brisk hug. The six green berets did not speak. One of them nodded at her, and the others gave Fossey a long stare. Then they filed off to their hooch at the edge of the compound. Please, she said, not a word. Fossey took a half-step forward and hesitated. It was as though he had trouble recognizing her. She wore a bush hat and filthy green fatigues. She carried the standard M16 automatic assault rifle. Her face, black with charcoal. Marianne handed him the weapon. I'm exhausted, she said. We'll talk later. She glanced over at the Special Forces area, then turned and walked quickly across the compound toads towards her own bunker. Fossey stood still for a few seconds, a little dazed, it seemed. After a moment, though, he set his jaw and went after her with a hard, fast stride. Not now, he yelled. Sorry. Not later, he yelled. Now! What happened between them, Rat said, nobody ever knew for sure. But in the mess hall that evening, it was clear that an accommodation had been reached. Or more likely, he said, it was a case of setting down some new rules. Marianne's hair was freshly shampooed, 
She wore a white blouse, a navy blue skirt, a pair of plain black flats. Over dinner, she kept her eyes down, poking at her food, subdued to the point of silence. Eddie Diamond and some of the others tried to nudge her out of talking, tried to nudge her into talking about the ambush. What was the feeling out there? What exactly did she see and hear? But the question seemed to give her trouble. Nervously, she'd look across the table at Fosse. She'd wait a moment, as if to receive some sort of clearance, then she'd bow her head and mumble out a vague word or two. There were no real answers. Mark Fosse, too, had little to say. Nobody's business, he told Rat that night. One thing's for sure, there won't be any more ambushes. No more late nights. You laid down the law? Compromise, Fosse said. I'll put it this way, we're officially engaged. Rat nodded cautiously. Well, hey, she'll make a sweet bride. Combat ready. Over the next several days, there was a strained, tightly wound quality to the way they treated each other, a rigid correctness that was enforced by repetitive acts of willpower. To look at them from a distance, Rat said, you would think they were the happiest two people on the planet. They spent the long afternoons sunbathing together, stretched out side by side on top of their bunker, while playing backgammon in the shade of a giant palm tree, or just sitting quietly. A model of togetherness, it seemed. And yet at close range, their faces showed the tension. Too polite. Too thoughtful. Mark Fossey tried hard to keep up a self-assured pose, as if nothing had come between them, or ever could. But there was a fragility to it, something tentative and false. If Marianne happened to move a few steps away from him, even briefly, he'd tighten up and force himself not to watch her. But then a moment later, he'd be watching. In the presence of others, at least, they kept on their masks. Over meals, they talked about plans for a huge wedding in Cleveland Heights, a two-day bash, lots of flowers. And yet, even then, their smiles seemed too intense. They were too quick with their banter. They held hands as if afraid to let go. It had to end, and eventually it did. Near the end of the third week, Fossa began making arrangements to send her home. At first, Rat said, Marianne seemed to accept it. But then after a day or two, she fell into a restless gloom, sitting off by herself at the compound's perimeters. Shoulders hunched, her blue eyes opaque, she seemed to disappear inside herself. A couple of times, Fosse approached her and tried to talk it out. But Marianne just stared out at the dark green mountains to the west. The wilderness seemed to draw her in. A haunted look, Rat said, partly terror, partly rapture. It was as if she had come up on the edge of something, as if she were caught in that no man's land between Cleveland Heights and deep jungle. Seventeen years old, just a child, blonde and innocent, but then weren't they all? The next morning, she was gone. The six greenies were gone, too. In a way, Rat said, Poor Fosse expected it, or something like it. But that did not help much with the pain. The kid couldn't function. The grief took him by the throat and squeezed and would not let go. Lost, he kept whispering. It was nearly three weeks before she returned. But in a sense, she never returned. Not entirely, not all of her. By chance, Rat said, he was awake to see it. A damp, misty night, so he couldn't sleep. So he'd gone outside for a quick smoke. He was just standing there, watching the moon. And then off to the west, a column of silhouettes appeared, as if by magic, at the margin of the jungle. At first, he didn't recognize her. A small, soft shadow among six other shadows. There was no sound, no real substance either. The seven silhouettes seemed to float across the surface of the earth, like spirits, vaporous and unreal. As he watched, Rat said, it made him think of some freaky opium dream. 
The silhouettes moved without moving. Silently, one by one, they came up the hill, passed through the wire, and drifted in a loose file across the compound. It was then, Rat said, that he picked out Marianne's face. Her eyes seemed to shine in the dark, not blue, though, but a bright, glowing jungle green. She did not pause at Fossey's bunker. She cradled her weapon and moved swiftly to the special forces hooch and followed the others inside. Briefly, a light came on and someone laughed. Then the place went dark again. Whenever he told the story, Rat had a tendency to stop now and then, interrupting the flow, inserting little clarifications or bits of analysis and personal opinion. It was a bad habit, Mitchell Sanders said, because all that matters is the raw material, the stuff itself, and you can't clutter it up with your own half-baked commentary. That just breaks the spell, destroys the magic. What you have to do, Sanders said, is trust your own story. Get the hell out of the way and let it tell itself. But Rat Kylie couldn't help it. He wanted to bracket the full range of meaning. I know it sounds far out, he'd tell us, but it's not like impossible or anything. We all heard plenty of wackier stories. Some guy comes back from the bush, tells you he saw the Virgin Mary out there. She was riding a goddamn goose or something. Everybody buys it. Everybody smiles and asks how fast they were going. Did she have spurs on? Well, it's not like that. This Marianne wasn't no virgin, but at least she was real. I saw it. When she came in through the wire that night, I was right there. I saw those eyes of her. I saw how she wasn't even the same person no more. What's so impossible about that? She was a girl, that's all. I mean, if it was a guy, everybody would say, hey, no big deal, he got caught up in the nom shit. He got seduced by the greenies. See what I mean? You've got these blinders on about women, how gentle and peaceful they are. All that crap about how if we had a pussy for president, there wouldn't be no more wars. Pure garbage. You gotta get rid of that sexist attitude. Rat would go on like that until Mitchell Sanders couldn't tolerate it anymore. It offended his inner ear. The story, Sanders would say. The whole tone, man. You're wrecking it. The tone? The sound. You need to get a consistent sound. Like slow and fast. Slow or fast. Funny or sad. All these digressions, they just screw up your story's sound. Stick to what happened. Frowning. Rat would close his eyes. Tone, he'd say. I didn't know it was all that complicated. The girl joined the zoo. One more animal. End of story. Yeah, fine. But tell it right. At daybreak the next morning, when Mark Fossey heard she was back, he stationed himself outside the fenced-off Special Forces area. All morning he waited for her, and all afternoon. Around dusk, Rat brought him something to eat. She has to come out, Fossey said. Sooner or later, she has to. Or else what, Rat said. I go get her. I bring her out. Rat shook his head. Your decision. If I was you, though, no way I'd mess around with any greenie types. Not for nothing. It's Mary Ann in there. Sure, I know that. All the same, I'd knock real extra super polite. Even with the cooling night air, Fossey's face was slick with sweat. He looked sick. His eyes were bloodshot. His skin had a whitish, almost colorless cast. For a few minutes, Rat waited with him, quietly watching the hooch. Then he patted the kid's shoulder and left him alone. It was after midnight when Rat and Eddie Diamond went out to check on her. The night had gone cold and steamy, a low fog sliding down from the mountains, and out in the dark there was music playing. Not loud, but not soft either. It had a chaotic, almost unmusical sound, without rhythm or form or progression, like the noise of nature. A synthesizer, it seemed, or maybe an electric organ. In the background, just audible, a woman's voice was half singing, half chanting, but the lyrics seemed to be in a foreign tongue. They found Fossey squatting near the gates in front of the Special Forces area. Head bowed, 
He was swaying to the music, his face wet and shiny. As Eddie bent down beside him, the kid looked up with eyes, not quite in register, ashen and powdery. Hear that? He whispered. You hear? It's Mary Ann. Eddie Diamond took his arm. Let's get you inside. Somebody's radio. That's all it is. Move it now. Mary Ann, just listen. Sure, but listen. Fossey suddenly pulled away, twisting sideways, and fell back against the gate. He lay there with his eyes closed. The music, the noise, whatever it was, came from the hooch beyond the fence. The place was dark except for a small glowing window, which stood partly open, the panes dancing in bright reds and yellows, as though the glass were on fire. The chanting seemed louder now, fiercer too, and higher pitched. Fossey pushed himself up. He wavered for a moment, then forced the gate open. That voice, he said, Mary Ann. Rat took a step forward, reaching out for him, but Fossey was already moving fast towards the hooch. He stumbled once, caught himself, and struck the door hard with both arms. There was a noise, a short screeching sound, like a cat, and the door swung in, and Fossey was framed there for an instant, his arms outstretched, and he slipped inside. After a moment, Rat and Eddie followed quietly. Just inside the door, they found Fossey bent down on one knee. He wasn't moving. Across the room, a dozen candles were burning on the floor near the open window. The place seemed to echo with a deep wilderness sound, tribal music bamboo flutes and drums and chimes. But what hit you first, Rat said, was the smell. Two kinds of smells. There was a topmost scent of joss sticks and incense, like the fumes of some exotic smokehouse. But beneath the smoke lay a deeper and much more powerful stench. Impossible to describe, Rat said. It paralyzed your lungs thick and numbing, like an animal's den, a mix of blood and scorched hair and excrement and the sweet, sour odor of moldering flesh, the stink of the kill. But that wasn't all. On a post at the rear of the hooch was the decayed head of a large black leopard. Strips of yellow-brown skin dangled from the overhead rafters, and bones Stacks of bones, all kinds. To one side, propped up against the wall, stood a poster in neat black lettering. Assemble your own gook free sample kit. The images came in a swirl, Rat said, and there was no way you could process it all. Off in the gloom, a few dim figures lounged in hammocks or on cots, but none of them moved or spoke. The background music came from a tape deck near the circle of candles but the high voice was Mary Ann's. Mark Fossey started to get up, but then stiffened. Mary Ann, he said. Quietly, she stepped out of the shadows. At least for a moment, she seemed to be the same pretty young girl who had arrived a few weeks earlier. She was barefoot. She wore her pink sweater and a white blouse and a simple cotton skirt. For a long while, the girl glazed down at Fossey, almost blankly. And in the candlelight, her face had the composure of someone perfectly at peace with herself. It took a few seconds, Rat said, to appreciate the full change. In part, it was her eyes, utterly flat and indifferent. There was no emotion in her stare, no sense of the person behind it. But the grotesque part, he said, was her jewelry. At the girl's throat was a necklace of human tongues, elongated and narrow, like pieces of blackened leather. The tongues were threaded along a length of copper wire, one tongue overlapping the next. The tips curled upward as if caught in a final shrill syllable. Just for a moment, the girl looked at Mark Fossey with something close to contempt. There's no sense talking, she said. I know what you think, but it's not, 
It's not bad. Bad? Fosse murmured. It's not. In the shadows, there was laughter. One of the greenies sat up and lighted a cigar. The others lay silent. You're in a place, Marianne said softly, where you don't belong. She moved her hand in a gesture that encompassed not just the hooch, but everything around it. The entire war, the mountains, the mean little villages, the trails and trees and rivers and deep misted over valleys. You just don't know. You hide in this little fortress behind wire and sandbags, and you don't know. Sometimes I just want to eat this place, the whole country, the dirt, the death. I just want to swallow it and have it there inside me. That's how I feel. It's like this appetite. I get scared sometimes, lots of times, but it's not bad. I feel close to myself. When I'm out there at night, I feel close to my own body. I can feel my blood moving, my skin and my fingernails, everything. It's like I'm full of electricity and I'm glowing in the dark. I'm on fire almost. I'm burning away into nothing. But it doesn't matter because I know exactly who I am. You can't feel like that anywhere else. All of this was said without drama. As if to herself, her voice slow and impassive. She was not trying to persuade. For a few moments, she looked at Mark Fossey, who seemed to shrink away. Then she turned and moved back into the gloom. There was nothing to be done. Rat took Fossey's arm, helped him up, and led him outside. In the darkness, there was that flipped-out tribal music, which seemed to come from the earth itself, from the deep rainforest, and a woman's voice rising up in a language beyond translation. Mark Fossey stood rigid. Do something, he whispered. I can't just let her go like that. Rat listened for a time, then shook his head. Man, you must be deaf. She's already gone. Rat Kylie stopped there, almost in mid-sentence, which drove Mitchell Sanders crazy. What's next, he said. Next? The girl, what happened to her? Rat made a small, tired motion with his shoulders. Hard to tell for sure. Three, four days later, I got orders to report here to Alpha Company. Jumped the first chopper out. That's the last I ever seen of the place. Marianne, too. Mitchell Sanders stared at him. You can't do that. Do what? Jesus Christ, it's against the rules, Sanders said. Against human nature. This elaborate story, you can't just say, hey, by the way, I don't know the ending. I mean, you have certain obligations. Rat gave a quick smile. Okay, ma'am, but up to now, everything I told you is from personal experience. The exact truth. There's a few other things I heard secondhand. Thirdhand, actually. From here on, it gets to be, I don't know what the word is, speculation. Yeah, right. Rat looked off to the west, scanning the mountains as if expecting something to appear in any one of the high ridge lines. After a second, he shrugged. Anyhow, maybe two months later, I ran into Eddie Diamond over in Bangkok. I was on R&R, &R, just this fluke thing. And he told me some stuff that I can't vouch for with my own eyes. Even Eddie didn't really see it. He heard it from one of the greenies, so you gotta take this with a whole shaker full of salt. Once more, rats searched the mountains and he sat back and closed his eyes. You know, he said abruptly, I loved her. I say what? A lot. We all did, I guess. The way she looked. Marianne made you think about those girls back home, how pure and innocent they all are, how they'll never understand any of this, not in a billion years. Try to tell them about it. They'll just stare at you with these big, round, candy eyes. They won't understand zip. It's like trying to tell somebody what chocolate tastes like. Mitchell Sanders nodded. Or shit. There it is. You got to taste it. And that's the thing with Mary Ann. She was there. She was up to her eyeballs in it. After the war, man, I promise you, you won't find nobody like her. Suddenly, Rat pushed up to his feet 
moved a few steps away from us, then stopped and stood with his back turned. He was an emotional guy. Got hooked, I guess, he said. I loved her, so when I heard from Eddie about what happened, it almost made me... Well, like you say, it's pure speculation. Go on, Mitchell Sanders said. Finish up. What happened to her, Rad said, was what happened to all of them. You come over clean, and you get dirty, and then afterwards it's never the same. A question of degree. Some make it intact, some don't make it at all. For Marianne Bell, it seemed Vietnam had the effect of a powerful drug. That mix of unnamed terror and unnamed pleasure that comes as the needle slips in and you know you're risking something. The endorphins start to flow, and the adrenaline, and you hold your breath and creep quietly through the moonlit nightscapes. You become intimate with danger. You're in touch with the far side of yourself, as though it's another hemisphere, and you want to string it out and go wherever the trip takes you and be host to all the possibilities inside yourself. Not bad, she had said. Vietnam made her glow in the dark. She wanted more. She wanted to penetrate deeper into the mystery of herself. And after a time, the wanting became needing, which then turned to craving. According to Eddie Diamond, who heard it from one of the greenies, she took a greedy pleasure in night patrols. She was good at it. She had the moves. All camouflaged up, her face smooth and vacant. She seemed to flow like water through the dark, like oil, without sound or center. She went barefoot. She stopped carrying a weapon. There were times, apparently, when she took crazy, death-wish chances, things that even the greenies balked at. It was as if she was taunting some wild creature out in the bush, or in her head, inviting it to show itself, a curious game of hide-and-go-seek that was played out in the dense terrain of a nightmare. She was lost inside herself. On occasion, when they were taken under fire, Mary Ann would stand quietly and watch the tracer rounds snap by, a little smile on her lips, intent on some private transaction with the war. Other times, she would simply vanish altogether, for hours, for days. And then one morning, all alone, Mary Ann walked off into the mountains and did not come back. No body was ever found. No equipment, no clothing. For all he knew, Rat said, the girl was still alive. Maybe up in one of the high mountain vills. Maybe with the Montanard tribes. But that was guesswork. There was an inquiry, of course, and a week-long air search. And for a time, the Trabong compound went crazy with MPs and CID types. In the end, nothing came of it. It was a war, and the war went on. Mark Fossey was busted, the PFC, shipped back to a hospital in the States, and two months later received a medical discharge. Marianne Bell joined the missing. But the story didn't end there. If you believe the Greenies, Rat said, Marianne was still somewhere out there in the dark. Odd movements, odd shapes. Late at night, when the Greenies were out on ambush, the whole rainforest seemed to stare in at them, a watching feeling. And a couple times, they almost saw her sliding through the shadows. Not quite, but almost. She had crossed to the other side. She was part of the land. She was wearing her collots, her pink sweater, and a necklace of human tongue. She was dangerous. She was ready for it.